Aqualung. Jethro Tull. Hello, I'm Carl Baldassar, and today we're going to take a look at one of the most groundbreaking riffs and groundbreaking songs of all time in rock history, the song Aqualung by the band Jethro Tull. In this episode, I'm going to try to make some sense of what is and was a very peculiar sounding song and a bizarre collection of chords and harmonic movement. So let's dig in. As I break down the song, I'm going to talk about the riff, of course, how could you not talk about this great riff, and what makes it so cool and effective. We're going to talk about this very strange and bizarre chord progression, certainly at the beginning. And I want to talk a little bit about Martin Barr and his impact, and certainly his influence on me. We're going to talk a little bit about the production and orchestration of this song. And finally, I'm going to give you some historical context for the piece. This was such a pivotal piece for the band and a pivotal moment in music, rock music history. In fact, it went to number seven on the Billboard charts and it went to number four in the UK charts in early 1971. I can't stress enough how sonically, harmonically, visually, and emotionally unique this piece was. And if you were trained in harmony, you would never have come up with this song. In fact, it's a logic unto itself, and thank goodness that they were living in this strange universe of sounds and didn't have formal training. You'd never write this thing. Now, you can't talk about Aqualung without talking about the great opening riff, a riff that Ian Anderson composed, and it really is based off of a G minor blues scale, so you have that collection of notes for a blues scale, and that's kind of neat because Jethro Tull was a blues band just a couple albums before they released Aqualung, so it's kind of fitting in with their background. But in my estimation, Aqualung became Aqualung when that riff landed in the hands of Martin Barr. <laughs> that sound on the electric guitar and the way Martin Barr played it, and he's a, such a big hero of mine, you know, but he brought to that riff and the sound in his playing style, he brought that damping, downstroke, Les Paul driven sound, and it really made that riff become what it is. In fact, I would argue that this pitch collection and this riff is just as iconic as Beethoven's Fifth Symphony opening figure. <laughs> Both of those are epic riffs, so really an important statement in rock music history. So what makes this riff so iconic and so effective? I mean, it is out of the G minor blues scale, but the difference is, is the way that they're focusing on the tritone nature of the riff. And what I mean by a tritone is that it's merely an interval of a flat five. And a tritone is nothing more than three whole steps, an interval separated by three whole steps. So in this case, you've got one whole step, G to A, A to B, and B, we'll call it D flat for this exercise. So between G and D flat, we have three whole tones, three whole steps. And when I put those intervals together, I get a tritone. So now in a blues scale, you have this little chromatic figure. But notice what they're doing. They're actually not keeping that chromatic figure together. They're toggling around that D flat tritone sound. They're not going. They're not doing that. They're actually toggling. Toggling around the tritone sound. And that's what makes this sound and this riff leap off the page. Is that tritone emphasis. And when you listen to that interval, the tritone, it's incredibly unstable. And actually, in the late Middle Ages to the 18th century, it was a forbidden interval. In fact, it was called Diabolus in Musica, the devil in music. But of course, that has long passed, and now you can play tritone. They've become very helpful, actually, in modern harmony, because it really is just part of a dominant seventh chord. But enough of that. Let's just go on into the song and take a look at what happens after that introduction riff. So let's take a look at the structure of the verses here. Now, there's really two types of verses. There's the rock verse, the electric verse, which follows this great iconic riff. And then there's an acoustic verse, and we'll get to that in a moment. But watch how this first verse is put together with a bizarre selection of chords. I'll play it for you again. Now, we're all familiar 
familiar with that sound on the electric guitar, but let me actually play you the actual chords that are implied by the whole band underneath that riff because it's very, very unusual. So we'll take it right from the walk up, the D flat, E flat to F. So we have the Now the Martin Barr and the, and the line actually starts going to a single note on the guitar, but the harmony underneath that is quite strange. You get a lot of second inversion triads moving in a, in, in a strange way. And it kind of is doing this. So when you get up to that F, the get this action here. You get like an F 11th and then everything is a second inversion. That's a strange universe. You find these major triads are not in any key. They don't belong in any key. You can't find a key that they fit in. But with all these second inversion sounds, The one thing that's normal about that is the very last chord. It ends on a D major chord. And what happens there after you get to the D major chord, you go back to one. And so we actually have a five to one cadence at the end of that. But that's the only normal thing about this progression. Everything else is completely bizarre. So you get finally to the D chord going to one. And really what you're hearing there is five going to one, a D going to a G minor. So, otherwise, it's a strange world that we're in. Making it even more bizarre is the guitar overdub with these parallel major thirds that are going on with the chords. Now, I'm going to play the two parts together. Martin Barr didn't play them together, but I just want you to hear these major thirds. <laughs> That is so strange. It's just incredible that they would come up with that. And if you were trying to do harmonic analysis of that chord progression, forget it. You can't do it. It defies all sorts of nomenclature. In other words, trying to describe it as this is a one chord, six chord, blah, 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 blah. You can't do it. It's just a logic unto itself. And that's kind of true for the rest of the song as well. Now let's go to the acoustic version of the verse. And it's such a stunning change when we go from the heavy rock version of the verse to this solitary acoustic guitar with this piano and a bit of a walking bass figure. And it's very stunning impact from a production and orchestration perspective. Now the verse chords on the acoustic guitar are G minor, F, and C. And then there's a C minor in there as well. So let me play it for you and then we'll talk about, we'll try to do some harmonic analysis of it, okay? So it basically goes like this. Apart from the fact that Ian Anderson plays the acoustic guitar so beautifully and he's using this small parlor acoustic guitar, but what is really a signature of, of Ian Anderson's acoustic playing is using all these sus chords, you know, the... <laughs> I mean, that little type of figuration is what made Jethro Tull what it was, you know, the kind of folk element that followed them throughout the rest of their career. So this was really groundbreaking for them. But now let's just take a look at these chords, right? So we have a G, a G minor, an F, an F, a C major. Ah, now we're going to have a C minor, and then a G minor, and we go back to F. Two bars of that with the sus chords in it. Now if I was going to try to analyze for you what that progression is in terms of key, I would actually default to this being a G Dorian type of sound uh, because it would really then pan, pan out to be a, a two chord going to a one chord, the F, another one chord to a five chord, a five major. Now we have a, a borrowed five, so it's kind of what they call a mixed mode. Okay, so I'm borrowing from the minor mode to play the, the C minor to 
back to the G minor, which is a two chord, and then we end on a one chord, an F. So why am I saying G Dorian? I mean, somebody might say, well, it could be G minor. Yes, it could be G minor, but from a harmonic analysis perspective, you wind up with some clumsy Roman, clumsy Roman numerals here. You'd have your first chord, if, it, if that's the one chord, the minor one, then your F chord has to be a capital Roman numeral seven chord, okay? And you're playing that Roman numeral seven a lot because you've got one bar of G, two bars of this Roman numeral seven, the F chord, and you're going to a four chord. And, and from my estimation that the chord that's played most frequently in the progression to me oftentimes default to what really is the one chord. So rather than declaring this in G minor and saying the F is a Roman numeral seven chord, I would rather look at it as saying the F is really the one chord. And that's how I arrive at it being a G Dorian sort of collection. So that I have a two chord, a one chord, a one chord, a five chord, a borrowed five, the two, and then I'm ending the progression on one, which is a natural thing. It's so beautiful though, and you set that in high relief against the electric verse with the riff and then those strange, bizarre chords, you know. It's really, really tasteful how he does that. And then to add further texture to the song, he just simply brings the verse chords up tempo. So you get this. Do you still remember December's foggy free? And the ice that clings on to your beard, your screaming agony. Hey, boom, and he goes off like that. So just doubling the tempo of the same chords make you feel like you have a different scene. And it certainly was a different scene. Now before we get to the guitar solo, I wanna show you the chords that are being played underneath the guitar solo. There's a little change there, and actually it sort of suggests a little different key change here, okay? So what he's doing on the, um, on the guitar solo section, on the guitar, on the acoustic guitar, is that he's got the G minor. <laughs> got a G minor, and now he's introducing the E flat to an F, back to the G minor. And I would, if I had to do a harmonic analysis on that, which, which is a bit sketchy, but if I had to do it, I would try to probably articulate that in the key of B flat. Why? Because I think we're looking at here a six chord in the key of B flat, okay? And then we're looking at a four chord the E flat is the four chord, and then I have a five chord, which is the F. So I've got a four to five, and then I have it, he has it going back to the minor, which would be the six chord. But I would suggest that that last minor chord is a function substitution of B flat major. And what I mean by function substitution, because you can substitute for any one, four, five chord, there are two alternative chords that you can play that share common tones. And in the case of the one chord, if, if you're buying my B flat key signature move here, in case of the one chord, B flat, we have the common tones of B flat and D. And when you go to the G minor, we still have B flat and D, right? So I'm suggesting it's in the key of B flat with the, with the repeat of the G minor at the end being a function substitution of the one chord. Now let's talk about the guitar solo and Martin Barr's influence on this song. And it really is one of the greatest rock guitar solos of all time. It's so beautiful. And Martin Barr brings some really cool little techniques to this thing. So he uses a lot of damping, a lot of double stops. He's got this really interesting vibrato. And his phrasing is so elegant throughout this solo. Let me just give you a taste of it, you know, just like at the entrance, because it's so beautiful. He has this grand entrance. <laughs> On and on it goes. It's just so beautiful. All that phrasing is amazing. Listen to the question and answers of this grand entrance. You know, he's got the kind of question and then absolutely an answer. And then you've got another question. 
And did you catch the little double stop in there? Right, that double stop, those little sort of colors are totally Martin Barr all the way. And then notice his vibratos at the end of this. And then more double stops here. I would have a tendency to want to pick that clean. But no, he's actually double stopping. And then the G minor double stop. And these little shiver vibratos. That's unnatural for me. I don't do my vibrato that way. He's got these hypersonic shivering vibratos. It's so Martin Barr, man. I'm just really envious of how beautiful that is. And then, of course, he takes off and you have it. So when I mentioned double stops, because he's using a lot of that in the solo, I'm using kind of a classical term, which is often used for like string players. But same thing for the guitar. And a double stop is just um, stopping two notes with your finger at the same time. So when he's doing... Um, I have this. See the E and the G are together. And he does more double stops here. You know, rather than that's not double stop. This is double stop. Very important little subtle technique, but it's really, really a signature of Martin Barr. And if you go to the very end of the solo, I just love how he's moving. The phrasing is moving all the way up to the neck. And at the end, he's winding up with this ending. With that shiver vibrato on the end of that. I mean, it is so well constructed. And this will blow your mind if you didn't know this already. So when he's in the recording studio by himself playing the solo, all the engineers, producers, probably Ian's watching in, guess who pops into the control room? None other than Jimmy Page, because Led Zeppelin was in the same studio recording Led Zeppelin II, I believe it was. And Jimmy Page comes up waving hi to Martin Barr while he's in the studio playing this iconic solo, and he has to turn his back. You know, he's thinking, I'm gonna blow it, you know, Jimmy Page is here. Like, I would just be like, forget it, just send me off to the loony bin. There's no way I could have done that, you know? But anyway, he pulled it off. And not only did he pull it off, again, it's one of the greatest rock guitar solos of all time. Martin Barr, man, he deserves a lot of love. So to wrap things up, I wanna zoom out and I wanna look at the production and orchestration of this song. Now, ironically, if I'm talking about a Jethro Tull song, I'm gonna be talking about the unique uh, use of a flute in a rock song, because that was Ian Anderson, and that's really what set the band apart. But as I said, ironically, there's no flute in the song Aqualung. So we don't have that in terms of production, but we've got a couple of other really cool things going on here. So it's really the first song where they had this clear juxtaposition or a clear combination of the electric guitar, the Les Paul, in the hands of Martin Barr with that heavy, damping, great sound. And we have the parlor acoustic guitars that only Ian Anderson plays in Ian Anderson's way with all those little sus chords and that sort of minstrel sort of strumming that he does. And putting the electric and acoustic guitars together was really a beautiful, unique sound and created the world of Aqualung. And I would have to mention also that part of the orchestration is going to be uh, Ian Anderson's voice. He has, he has a very uncommon rock voice. And um, we're all thankful that actually we had this voice in rock and roll history. He's got this baritone voice, so it's not that kind of a rock voice. And he also had a lot of unusual lyrics because he was at the front end of the progressive rock world. And that we've moved lyrically from very literal sort of lyrics to things that are um, very visual and very imaginary. I mean, if I were to pull out a couple of lyrics, and they're, they're just a different world that he's creating. You know, he gives you the visual sitting on a park bench, you know, and you can visualize that. But we start talking about greasy fingers, smearing shabby clothes, spitting out pieces of his broken luck, salvation a la mode with a cup of tea. We're getting into kind of the <laughs> Alice in Wonder, you know, looking glass kind of world. And that's very typical for progressive rock. And so I think that's part of what you know, created the sound and the mood and the imagery of this. And Right back then in 1971, you know, Jethro Tull was one of those tributaries of all things that were going progressive at the time. It was really, really the golden era 
of you know, progressive rock and of rock in my estimation. One other really important uh, production orchestration element that is now overlooked and it was overdone for a while, but Ian Anderson was one of the first ones to do it. It's where he introduced this telephone, megaphone sounding voice in the first acoustic verse. And you may recall um, it went something like this. And that megaphone, telephone sounding voice, which wound up being used a lot in later years, that would have had a very significant meaning to the British population because that sound was the sound of the speaker system, the loudspeaker systems, which would have warned Londoners in the, 40 of the, in the 1940s of the oncoming German blitz. So it, there's a very emotional, sentimental sadness to that whole thing. And the song is rather sad. So there, it is a very emotional technique that we don't understand today because that time is long gone. And so it has a lot of power. And it's a piece of orchestration that's done by production, right? So it's pretty cool to think of production as orchestration. Let's talk about the history of what was going on at the time that this song was written and recorded. So the song was recorded in December of 1970 through February of 1971. And there was a lot going on in the world and especially Britain in 1970. It was a transitional time and there were certain events that I think are sort of emblematic of a time in transition. So in London in January of 1970, the legal age for drinking was dropped from 21 to 18. That was help helpful for progressive rock. There was in April, Paul McCartney announced that he had left the Beatles. So there's a big void there, the end of an era, right? And we have the progressive rock world, you know, really starting to come into four. On August 3rd, it was the third Isle of Wight uh, festival, and it was bigger than Woodstock. And of course, Jethro Tull played there, but it was an incredible lineup. Could you imagine, you know, having Hendrix and uh, Chicago, Joni Mitchell, Miles Davis, 10 years after, ELP, The Doors, The Who, Sly and the Family Stone, Free, The Moody Blues. I mean, it was amazing. Unfortunately, the next month in September, Jimi Hendrix died in London. Again, another closing chapter in rock music history. And then finally in December, uh, Paul McCartney sued to dissolve the Beatles, so it was truly over on the very month that uh, they were recording Aqualung. I'd also like to say that uh, the number one song of the time in 1970 was Bridge Over Troubled Waters. So that's pretty symbolic for what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it was a time of change and music acts are kind of a reflecting pool. And Aqualung is really a reflection of that time and that culture and what was going on. And it certainly was at the center of it all. Jethro Tolls Aqualung. Thank you. I'm Carl Baldessar. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like and subscribe and share it and leave me a comment on this episode or maybe some other classic rock songs you'd like me to cover. Thank you and we'll see you again.